here is my reflection for this Remembrance Sunday. When I first began at Fourth Universalist, one of the first things I did was explore the building. In old places like our building, there are bound to be curious nook, nooks, dark corners, and mysteries to uncover. One of the first places I went was the tower. I've always loved towers. They seem like magical places where wizards might live. Now you can't see it now, I think. I'm not there to actually see it. But earlier this week, behind plastic and beams on the north side of the building, there is a winding stone staircase. That day, early on in my time with all of you, I decided to explore it. I eagerly began my ascent. It was not the safest experience, that stairwell up to the tower. The handrail rail had dropped off the wall, taking a chunk of stone off with it. It was very dark. It was foreboding. Plaster from the ceiling had fallen and lay scattered on the steps, and I was careful not to slip. When I reached the top, I opened the door to the tower room. I was greeted with a space that had once clearly been used, but a long time ago. On the walls, the paint was peeling, an image of the chalice, painted in a way that would reveal the room's path as a teen room, was drooping, hanging off the wall. The ceiling was high, 20, 30 feet up, anchored by a ruined old carpet, covered in stains. The tower room had clearly been beautiful once. On the north side, there was a red and beige stone alcove, stately, old, as if reminding anyone who visited this room that it was meant to be important. In the middle of that alcove was an empty hole, as if something valuable had been there. In front of this alcove, laying on the spoiled carpet, was a bronze vase, modeled after a Greek amphora. I picked it up, curious, and found it heavier than I expected. I lifted it back into the alcove where it was clearly supposed to be, I tried to fit it in, then screw it in, then gently jam it down. But the base was broken and nothing was working. It was then I noticed that my hands were covered in dust. And my shirt and my pants covered in white and gray dust. In that moment, I remember freezing, realizing exactly what I was covered in. This was not a vase. It was an urn. And it wasn't dust. It was someone's ashes. The tower was a mortuary chapel, a tomb, and someone's final resting place. This was how I first learned of Madeline. Now, Madeline Smodbeck is one of two people whose remains rest at Fourth Universalist. Madeline is in the Tower Mortuary, and Abby Cromwell Ames, who died a few years after Madeline, rests in our chapel. Each year at Remembrance Sunday, we honor our ancestors. And it is easy to lift up certain people, the great ministers of our congregation, the men who have their faces cast in metal around the front that we gaze at each and every week, people whose accomplishments are deemed worthy of Wikipedia articles. We may not know their names, but we believe that they are important. I have never heard anyone in the congregation during my six or so years at Fourth Universalist mention Abby or Madeline, and yet they have been with us since before any of us arrived here, before almost everyone here was even born. I wonder about what would lead someone to want their ashes here. They must have loved this community very much. It must have felt like home to them. It is remarkable that of all the thousands of people who have come through our doors over many, many decades, only these two chose this as their final home. This unique and faithful decision asks something sacred of us, that we, those who come after, are good stewards of their memories and what remains of them on earth. We have not, I believe, honored them as we should if the state of Madeline's urn on the dirty carpet in the tower is indicative. Perhaps by knowing them a little, we can start to change that. Madeline was born in 1886 as the daughter of a German immigrant father and American mother. 
She married her husband, Warren, who was a trustee of this congregation and a pioneer in American real estate, the Henry Ford of real estate, as one article called him. He was instrumental in developing parts of Long Island, including Fire Island. Together, they had three children and lived at 48 West 74th Street, now Parkside School, which at the time was next to a sanatorium. They were well off, with a butler, a cook, and a houseman, but it didn't keep them from being robbed of a $12,000 necklace, a heist that made the news. Now, Madeline died unexpectedly at the age of 50 in 1936. Her husband petitioned the church board, led at the time by Abby's husband, actually, to construct the alcove in the tower for Madeline, which they granted. We know that Madeline's values, especially as a member of this congregation, lived on through her children. Her daughter, Doris, especially embodied the universalist spirit. After their family developed Fire Island, Doris moved out there as one of the first settlers in 1939. Once described in the New York Times as the debutante daughter of a millionaire, she became the mother, quote, of Fire Island. She befriended and encouraged the growing gay population when many other residents were appalled by their presence. In an interview, she described playing pool with a regular group of 15 gay men and hosting drag shows at a local bar. When the AIDS epidemic arrived, her role changed from friend to caregiver. Within a few years, all 15 of her pool partners were dead. She opened her home to those dying of the disease, making sure no one felt alone or rejected in their final days. When asked in an interview how an elderly lady could be so compassionate and unafraid of this disease, she replied simply that her parents had gay friends. A testament to Madeline, no doubt, who despite passing away in 1936, inspired in her daughter a legacy of inclusion and kindness. She embodied the spirit of universalism and this congregation as well. We know more about Abby, who now resides in the chapel. You can see her in a small gold box embedded in the south stone wall. Abby was born in Brooklyn in 1879. She married Louis Annan Ames, who was the president of a large flag manufacturing company and responsible for designing the flag of New York City. We know that Abby came from a distinguished family with roots back to the Mayflower. She and Louis were married in 1909, right here in this building, and they invited over 1,000 guests. Louis was the president of the congregation board through more than the 20s and 30s, but Abby's contributions to the congregations were equally as, as impressive. For 10 years, Abby was a leader of the women's group, Takala, which translates to good deeds. Now, it is important to not underestimate the importance and impact of women's group in churches of that era, and especially of Takala. Their impact not only in the congregation, but the wider world. Takala operated one of the first medical clinics in the city geared towards mothers and babies, then called weighing stations. They grew to operate three distinct clinics for babies, preschools, and school-aged children. They made sure that in a time when medical care was scarce, especially for the poor, that anyone could make sure that their babies and their children were healthy. Takala worked with families sick from the 1918 influenza epidemic and held classes for immigrants looking to learn English and become citizens. They employed multiple doctors and social workers to help ensure mothers and their babies were healthy and getting what they needed. This was no small operation. In the 1924-25 year alone, the clinic served over 10,000 families. Under Abby's leadership, the congregation also hired Reverend Helen Ulrich to minister to these clinics. This choice was controversial, raising eyebrows because she was, quote, Manhattan's only woman minister. Well ahead of her time, Reverend Ulrich championed birth control, defended flappers, and motion pictures, all controversial things, and believed in bridging the divide between rich and poor, uneducated and educated. This all happened under Abby's leadership. She would step down from the leadership of Takala in 1929, 
and pass away 10 years later. It is likely, although I wasn't able to find evidence, that Abby and Madeline would have known each other. I like to think that they were friends, and perhaps that bond led to Abby's decision to join Madeline at Fourth Universalist, happy to spend eternity together. Now I share their stories today, incomplete and abridged as they are, because this is what universalism is about. Our world is a place, and even our congregation can be such a place, where only certain kinds of people are remembered. We honor our clergy, the great men who statues and faces are carved into stone and metal, and rightfully so, but too often we only honor those with a certain status, the senior minister, the real minister, conveniently forgetting those who worked with the poor over women like Reverend Ulrich. We forget and ignore objectively incredibly talented leaders and champions of our faith, like Madeline and Abby, who had tremendous devotion enough love for this place to have their ashes stored here forever. We forget them even though they are literally still with us. And we walk by Abbey every time we go by the chapel. We risk losing to memory devoted servants like Jim Wolford, whose 42 years perhaps make him the most dedicated servant to the congregation in its history. These people matter. And not just them, but all of us do, by extension. Most of us will not have our faces carved onto the wall of a building one day. Most of us will not have Wikipedia articles written about us. Most of us will fade into some degree of obscurity. But it doesn't mean that you or I or anyone is undeserving of remembrance. Or that anyone whose history or privilege or power obscures what is. There is nothing more universalist than remembering these folks, telling the stories of those who came before who mattered and yet were forgotten, and lifting them up, remembering that their lives were just as important as those who we see each and every week on the walls. One of my first acts as senior minister here was to have Madeline's urn return to her perch. The room still needs repair. The carpet is still stained, and the stairs are still littered mostly with plaster. But I dream one day when we will honor her, and as she deserves to be honored, as anyone deserves to be honored, and make her tower a place worthy of her last resting place. Until we do, let us honor her and Abby, and Jim Wolford, and Reverend Ulrich, and all the others we don't know but who matter just the same. We do so by remembering them in the same breath, in the same moment, in the same thought that we remember Reverend Chapin on the wall, and Reverend Eaton, and Reverend Hall. Abby and Madeline loved this place. They trusted us to care for what remained of them on this earth and to tend to this congregation they loved. Let us not fail them, their memory and the true spirit of universalism. May it be so. Amen. 